Senator Mark Kelly, thank you so much for spending some time with us today to discuss the role of the Congress in the future of national security. In the interest of time, let's just jump right into it, starting with a bit of a retrospective question. How did the Congress and Congress's role in national security change after 9-11? And now looking back with 20 years hindsight, do you think those changes have been mostly positive or are there some you wish we could take back? Well, Brian, uh, you know, like most people um, that were adults then, uh, well, even my oldest daughter, who was, you know, five or six uh, around 9-11, I mean, she remembers where she was uh, when she heard. So uh, like most of us, I remember where I was. I was, uh, get, I was training for what was going to be the next space shuttle flight, which is launching in November along uh, aboard space shuttle Endeavor. We were about two months from launch and I was uh, training in a simulator at the Johnson Space Center. So let me, you know, first say that as a 25-year veteran, of the Navy, you know, I flew in combat over Iraq during the first Gulf War. I'm grateful to all of the Americans, um, you know, who served our country in the wake of that horrible day uh, in September of 2001. Um, and and there were we're talking millions of individuals, right? I'm also been thinking a lot about the 13 U.S. service members who uh, recently were killed in a terrorist attack in Afghanistan, um, you know, helping, you know, our fellow Americans and our Afghan allies uh, evacuate uh, from the country. And, you know, some of these service members were just little kids when 9-11 happened. And it's, uh, it's really heartbreaking. And we owe them um, and, their, and their families a deep debt of gratitude. You know, for the past uh, 20 years that we've been at war, you know, first in uh, Afghanistan, and then you know, shortly thereafter in Iraq, um, it, it, it's been it's been a real trial, right? And as a new U.S. senator, it's hard for me, you know, to speak to the thoughts of somebody who was in Congress 20 years ago. Um, you know, however, I, I do know that the global war on terror has consumed much of the Congress's oversight role for the past uh, couple decades, and. Um, a lot of the focus was, I'd say, rightfully placed on ensuring that our troops um, that were in harm's way were equipped uh, to fight the battles they found themselves in. And much of the conversation around the defense budget was how do we equip our military for, for those wars, while also preparing uh, for conflicts that might arise uh, in the future. Those are difficult conversations to have, but they're 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 definitely necessary. And you know, we're having similar conversations today about how do we prepare um, our armed forces for uh, future threats. Um, we've now put Afghanistan behind us. You know, twenty years is incredibly a long long time to be in that conflict, uh, but it's important now that we look towards the future uh, of uh, you know the conflicts that we would like to stay out of, but could find ourselves in, uh, in the next couple decades. Yeah, thank you. And with that in mind, as we look forward to the next 20 years then in a new global security environment, what are your legislative priorities for the national security agenda? Well, um, you know, it's, it's about what I talk about looking to the future. I'm concerned mostly about uh, maintaining our competitive edge that we currently have in most areas over uh, near peer competitors like China and Russia. My primary concern though is China. Uh, you know, China is increasing its new nuclear stockpile every year. Uh, it's also uh, rapidly investing in a lot of emerging technologies uh, in some areas more so than, than we are. Uh, we also know that China is using a lot of soft power um, and using its economy to grow its sphere of influence across the globe. And I'm also current, concerned about um, the increased threat in, in cyberspace and whether our military, our critical infrastructure and our you know, private sector are adequately prepared uh, for what we might see in the future. You know. You know, China represents a growing threat of cyber attacks against us and coupled with Russia, who recently uh, compromised, um, I mean, uh, over 10,000, you know, customers uh, of solar winds via hack. I mean, we've got to do more to harden 
against this, against these cyber attacks, cyber attacks on our military, on our government, on businesses. Um, you know, these countries, uh, they're eager to harm us and we need to be better prepared for it. You mentioned the, uh, the requirement during the 20 years of the global war on terror to try to maintain our high end capabilities and be able to deter and potentially defeat uh, a near peer adversary. The, the popular narrative seems to be that we failed to do that to, to a large degree and that we fell behind and that our, our competitive advantage was eroded during those years. So now the national strategy is to reorient toward high end competition. Is there a risk though that it goes the other way and that in focusing on those high-end capabilities and the potential of a near-peer fight, we lose our irregular warfare capability and the ability to engage in hybrid or other types of warfare below the threshold of major conflict. Yeah, absolutely, there's a risk. I mean, uh, I'm the chairman of the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee uh, on Armed Services in the United States Senate. Uh, we're focused on these emerging threats, capabilities that other countries have or, or are obtaining uh, in, and in some cases, getting ahead of us on. So we've got to address that. You know, we've got to make, you know, make sure that we can ensure that we have air superiority over our near peer adversaries. We've got to make sure that we have a U United States Navy that can uh, outperform and outfight, um, you know, the, the, the PLA Navy or the Russian Navy. Uh, at the same time, what you talk about is incredibly important as well. It, it, it can't always be about the high-end fight. You know, that's why I've, uh, you know, been recently looking into and also focused on, you know, how do we provide adequate uh, close air support uh, for special operations forces, for uh, army troops. Um, the A-10, as, a, as an example, is an example of an airplane that does this job really well. Uh, better than any other platform in the history of aviation. The A-10 is the best at close air support. It's not in the high-end fight. It's, it's there to support our ground troops in, um, you know, in, a, in, a, in a, Afghanistan and Iraq very effectively, but we still need to maintain capabilities you know, like the A-10 um, because this can't always be about the first few days of any conflict. Um, this has also got to be about if we wind up in a long-term conflict, what is, what is month three, month six, what does year two look like? And uh, so I think it's important that we focus on both of these things, emerging threats and capabilities, new technology, innovation, at the same time, maintain, you know, the competitive advantage we have with what, for lack of a better term, the low end fight um, that, you know, to make, to make sure we still maintain those capabilities. Yeah. On the role of Congress, as elected representatives of the American people, how do you forge a coherent picture of the national interest when the country seems so divided on the most fundamental issues, including America's role in the world? Yeah, so it is a challenge. I mean, right now our politi politics are uh, very divisive. Um, I am somebody who is a strong believer in science and data and facts, uh, and let's not let the politics get in the way of us making the right decisions. Uh, also, let's try to find opportunities to bring our country together and bring individuals you know, together. We've got, um, you know, the thing I've, uh, and I've always believed this, uh, I mean, whether you're a uh, Republican, Democrat, or independent, I mean, we all have common goals, right? We want our kids to get a great education. We want people to have well-paying jobs and be able to support their families um, we want to make sure we have, you know, the best health care in the world. Th these are things we all agree, up, agree upon. It's just, you know, how do we get there? Uh, so I, I, I think it's important that we all try to focus on, um, you know, what, you know, where is the common ground and try to uh, not focus so much on those things that divide us. Um, and that's going to, uh, working together as a team, uh, and the team being, you know, all U.S. citizens, you know, that's how we're going to face uh, the threats that are out there. And they're significant. I mean, the threats to our national security are substantial. And as we face them in the coming decades, the best way we can do this is to be united as a team. Um, so I think we can all do a better job at, at working towards those goals. 
And uh, what's really a related question, Senator, I know you've been very busy over the last several weeks responding to the situation in Afghanistan. Is it too soon to ask? What are the lessons we should take from our 20 year adventure there and especially the events of the last two weeks or, or a few weeks? And, uh, you know, maybe what are the wrong lessons we could draw from this experience? Well, I think uh, one of the biggest lessons is, you know, when we make a decision to put uh, ground troops in a foreign land, uh, what's the exit strategy? I mean, when you look throughout history, uh, you typically deploy ground troops to take territory and to keep it. Uh, obviously not the goal we had in Afghanistan, um, but when we achieve, we, we, we should have had a set of objectives. And we, when we achieved those objectives, it should have been time to bring uh, the folks on the ground home. Uh, there's, you know, there's only so much we can do through air power, uh, through, you know, a, a naval force, uh, often you have to put the guy on the ground, but we also have a plan. We need to have a plan on when, when are we going to get them out? And that should never be a plan, you know, that would go for 20 years. Um, you know, I think the, uh, the second part of your question about, you know, what are the lessons I think you said that we really maybe shouldn't take away from this? Um, you know, I, I, I think, well, let me start about one other lesson we should get from this is, is that our analysis of situations, um, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be drinking our own Kool-Aid and think we have everything figured out. I mean, as we looked at the end game here in Afghanistan and pulling out the consensus among the intelligence community, among some really smart people that analyzed these situations was that Kabul could fall in six to 12 months. Well, it took about 12 days. Um, so one lesson is that we're not as smart as we think we are. Um, and I think it's important that we remind ourselves that. Um, I used to tell my, uh, you know, shuttle crew members, you know, sometimes that, uh, that none of us is as dumb as all of us. You know, that sometimes you can come together as a team and you think because you've talked to everybody, you got the right decision. Sometimes a team of people can make a really bad decision. Uh, the, you know, how we, uh, as a country, uh, you know, exited Afghanistan, it could have been done much better. Uh, these things are highly dynamic and unpredictable. Uh, we certainly didn't expect the Afghan military to fold like it did and the Afghan, the Afghan government to just leave. Um, could we have been pre better prepared for the worst case scenario? I think we could have been. To return just in, in closing to, to our topic, which is about the role of Congress. Uh, you know, there's as a, as a veteran, uh, all of us have been doing a lot of soul searching about the way things went in Afghanistan. You're relatively new to the Congress, to the Senate. Uh, do you think when you talk about the, our collective ability to make bad decisions, do you think that the Congress could have asserted itself more or could it in the future to prevent those kinds of bad decisions? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, but I think Congress is also uh, very capable of making bad decisions as well. We've seen that, you know, throughout history, the future is hard to predict, and we don't have all the answers. Um, you know, I think cons consensus and I mean, is, is a positive thing, but we also have to be very thoughtful and try to get as much data we can on the situation, try to make smart decisions. Uh, congressional oversight of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, you know, of the executive branch of government is incredibly important to the functioning of our government, to our democracy. Uh, congressional oversight of the Department of Defense uh, is critical. Uh, I'm proud to be a member of the Armed Services Committee. You know, we're going to continue, um, uh, it, well, in my role in the United States Senate, we're going to continue to do that. I think we all have to just strive to, you know, do a better job. Uh, and to realize that uh, the world is a changing place. It's a dangerous place. We need to be prepared. And it is Congress's role to provide that, that oversight. And uh, we need to uh, work hard to do, to do a good job at it. Senator Kelly, uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Thanks for your continued service. We look forward to seeing you here in Arizona when we can. Well, I'm here in Arizona now. I'd love to see you in person and maybe do this again. Uh, in person, Ryan, we got to get through this pandemic. I mean, this is a national security issue for us as well. So uh, for folks out there watching this who aren't vaccinated yet, I just want to say it's safe. It's well tested. It's effective. 
It's the only thing that's going to get us through this. Um, and it is a national security issue for us. Um, so thank you, everybody, for listening today. Thanks.